so you could say that there's uh, some similarities. Is this Joseph drawing upon this experience? Is this just common Methodist conversion experiences? And that was his inspiration uh, for these conversion experiences to Christ in the Book of Mormon, or are these just similar spiritual experiences, conversion experience, religious experiences uh, that people, ancient people are having converting to Christ. And this is just Joseph Smith's translation of an ancient text. And you can- Mormonism with the Murph, where Larry Singh explores church history and the church's truth claims. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the Murph. So we're continuing our series on the Book of Mormon. In the last episode, we had a look at the Jaredites and the Tower of Babel. Uh, that critics and scholars have pointed that the Tower of Babel is a uh, ideological myth, that it wasn't literal history, but the Jaredites talk about coming from the Great Tower in the Book of Mormon, alluding to did they come from the Tower of Babel and what could be some of the faithful responses to that. So go back and watch that video if you haven't. In this video, we're going to be looking at comparing uh, some of the sermons in the Book of Mormon, some of the conversion experiences, to Protestant Christianity, uh, specifically Methodist uh, sermons and conversion experiences uh, in Joseph Smith's environment at these revivals. And we're going to be focusing a lot on Grant Palmer's book. He wrote a book, An Insider View of Mormon Origins, which was a huge part of my first faith crisis. Uh, and whenever I left the church and lost my faith in the Book of Mormon, uh, and we're going to look at some of the critical arguments and some of the accounts of people how similar are they to the Book of Mormon and then some of the apologetic responses. So I hope this will be uh, a good video for the first slide. Uh, so this comes from Letter from My Wife. So it says, Revivals in early America started becoming popular in the early 1800s. This sensation became known as the Second Great Awakening. Camp in revivals were organized by every denomination in the New England area and regularly drew thousands of attendants per meeting. These revival camps typically give farmers like the Smiths the opportunity to take a break from their normal schedule and meet with friends and family for a few days of worship. Wooden pla platforms and, and towers were built so speakers could be seen and heard in the large crowds. And then Joseph Smith in his history says that I attended their several meetings as often as occasion would permit. In process of time, my mind became somewhat partial to the Methodist sect and I felt some desire to be united with them. So there were these uh, revivals and camp meetings uh, happening in frontier America, you know, preachers and people having conversion experiences and Joseph Smith and his family would have been attending. Uh, now we're going to look in the next slide comparing King Benjamin's sermon to a sermon given uh, by a Bishop McKendry. So it says the host of this large revival near the Smith's home was Reverend Benjamin G. Paddock who recorded the events in his memoir. The closing speaker was an aging, well-loved Methodist bishop who was there to give his final sermon. The attendants pitched their tents in a semicircle facing the tower. The congregation of more than 10,000 heard the ailing bishop express his love for them and their need of a saviour. The venerable Bishop McKendry then visited us for the last time. He was too feeble to preside and occupied the chair only once or twice. He stated with tearful emotion that he still had great affection for its members and that to take his final leave of them, so far at least as earth was concerned, was the special object of his visit. The spirit of the meeting was ad admirable. Conversions were numerous and powerful. And that comes from the memoir of Reverend Benjamin G. Paddock. Uh, and then he's uh, this author from Letter from My Wife is then comparing this, paralleling this with the sermon given by King Benjamin in Mosiah chapter 2. So it talks about, and they pitched their tents round about the temple, every man having his tent with the door thereof towards the temple, that thereby they might remain in their tents and hear the words which King Benjamin should speak unto them. For the multitude being so great that King Benjamin could not teach them all within the walls of the temple, therefore he caused a tower to be erected, and that thereby his people might hear the words which he should speak unto them. But I am like as yourselves, subject to all manner of infirmities in both body and mind. For what I say unto you that because I said unto you that I had spent my days in your service, I do not desire to boast, for I have only been in the service of your God. And I, even I, whom ye call your king, and no better than ye yourselves are, for I am also of the dust. And ye behold that I am old, and I am about to yield up this mortal frame to its mother earth. 
Uh, and we're going to read a section from uh, Grant Palmer's book. And he uh, talks about the the similarities between these two sermons. Um, but yeah, it's talking about sort of like a, a tower being erected that people came pitching their tents, both King Benjamin and uh, Bishop McKendry, both being very old uh, and speaking to the people. So we'll look at the next slide. Uh, and at the very bottom, uh, this comes from a letter from my wife. Could King Benjamin be named after Re Reverend Benjamin, the host of this revival in Palmyra, New York? Could the circumstances and content of the ailing bishop's final sermon have influenced the events of King Benjamin's speech? Okay, let's have a look at what Grant Palmer says. Protestant concepts appear to be abound. Nah, I'm going to do that again. Protestant concepts appear to abound in his discourses and experiences. For example, a Methodist camp meeting was held one mile from Palmyra, New York, on the 7th of June, 1826, a pivotal time in Joseph's life. Preparations for a camp meeting included leasing and consecrating the ground, thus the ground within the circle of the tents is considered sacred to the worship of God and is our chapel. The Methodists refer to those consecrated grounds as their house of God or temple. The Palmyra camp meeting reportedly attracted 10,000 people, Families came from all parts of the 100-mile conference district and pitched their tents facing the rear stand where the preachers were seated, including one named Benjamin G. Paddock. This large crowd heard the valedictory or farewell speech of their beloved Bishop McKendry, who made his appearance among us for the last time. He was the Methodist leader who had presided over the area for many years. The people had such reverence for the sainted man that all were melted and awed in his presence. In his emaciated and feeble condition he spoke of his love for the people and then delivered a powerful message that covered the whole process of personal salvation tremendous unity prevailed among the crowd and nearly every unconverted person on the ground committed oneself to christ at the close of the meeting the blessings and newly appointed stations of the preachers were made for the ontario district so grant palmer is talking about ten thousand people came uh, to listen to Bishop McKendry, uh, that they would call these consecrated grounds, Methodists, that their house of God, like their their temple, um, and that everyone had pitched their tents uh, facing towards where the tower was. Uh, and the similarities between him giving a sermon about sort of like the, the process of salvation and his love for the people, and King Benjamin talks about, uh, you know, service, serving, uh, the Nephites as their king and also talks about Christ and his atonement and uh, being saved through the atonement of Jesus Christ. So Grant Palmer is saying that there are these parallels and similarities uh, and could Joseph Smith have been there and could this have been where the idea or inspiration for King Benjamin came from from his environment? Uh, let's look at what Fair have to say. So Fair say the parallels between the Methodist camp meeting and King Benjamin's speech are general, sometimes manufactured and likely coincidental. They say there is no evidence that Joe Smith was even in the area in which the conference occurred. The critics confuse and combine different events and do not accurately report those events. The critics misreport the events in ways that seem calculated to make it seem more like the Book of Mormon than they were. The matter for which the conference was talked about had nothing to do with the matter which the critics tried to make the source for the Book of Mormon. Uh, so FAIR has uh, on, on their page, and I'll put the link in the description. So they say, where does all this stuff in Palmer's book come about this farewell speech and talking about the whole process of salvation? I'm not going to read through uh, the whole quote. You can read it on your screen. But they say, I have this highlighted in yellow. It's not Bishop McKendry who speaks on personal salvation. It's not even Benjamin Paddock. Uh, it was a Reverend Glazen Fillmore according to them. So this is either conflating uh, accounts, trying to trip this to Bishop McKendry. He was not the one who gave the speech about the whole process of uh, personal salvation. Problems with the comparison. While Joseph Smith's home is in Palmyra in June of 1826, Joseph himself is boarding with his future father-in-law, Isaac Hales. In Harmony, Pennsylvania in 1826, it seems unlikely that Joseph would have made the trip back to Palmyra to attend this event. That, that's a good point, because um, surely, yeah, if Joseph Smith was in Palmyra, it seems possible that he could have been there 
heard this sermon. Now we're finding out that it wasn't even Bishop McKendry who gave the sermon. And then Joseph Smith was actually boarding with at the heels at this time. And so there's actually a good possibility or likelihood he wasn't there. And then Farrell Addison goes on to say, this is the event for which the conference with its camp meeting was best remembered. So nowhere in either account is this man, Bishop McKendry, delivering a sermon on personal salvation. His role in the community has been overstated by Palmer. He hasn't attended the previous seven conferences between 1816 and 1826. Yes, there are some similarities that can be drawn, but these are nothing but coincidental. Palmer is misrepresenting his sources to make the parallel seem much stronger, trying to make the platform stage of the conference resemble King Benjamin's Tower, for example. So you could say, say that there are maybe some parallels between them, but really when you look uh, deeper out, I think we need to be more careful uh, with stating that King Benjamin's speech, that the inspiration came from uh, Bishop McKendry at the camp meeting. It's looking plausible from the evidence. Joseph Smith might not have been there. It's looking that it wasn't Bishop McKendry who gave uh, the speech on the whole process of personal salvation. Um, so I would be a lot more hesitant uh, with this. Now, actually, this comes from Blake Osler, and he talks about how we can often look at King Benjamin's speech as this sounds like a revival, revivalist sermon uh, preaching. And he talks about how it can look like that, but it also has some parallels to ancient covenant renewals and coronation ceremonies. Uh, so let's have a look. A Christian expansion in Mosiah's speech is detectable on form critical grounds. Mosiah 2 to 5 would appear to be reminiscent of a 19th century camp or revival meeting on first reading at a predetermined location where the people would sometimes camp in tents for several days. The revivalist would build a stage or stand from which he would preach and call his audience to a sense of their awful guilt. Those who were convicted in sin would come forward crying, what shall we do? They would be admonished to accept Christ. Many would experience a change of heart and sometimes would fall to the ground as if dead or exhibit physical spasms. The names of those who experienced conversions would sometimes be recorded. So even if it's not based on that specific sermon by Bishop McKendry, there are, you know, some similarities to a revivalist sermon or a preacher, you know, being on a tar, uh, preaching to the audience about sort of their sin and them feeling guilt, uh, telling them that they would need to repent of their sin, crying out, what shall we do? Uh, told to accept Christ as their savior and experiencing a mighty change of heart and even uh, some physical manifestations as well. However, not all of Mosiah 1 to 6 can be explained as a 19th century camp meeting and conversion experience. No 19th century camp meeting was convened by royal proclamation requiring the attendance of the entire nation to be present at the temple where the king would consecrate his son as his successor. Furthermore, those attending brought firstlings of their flocks for burnt offerings according to the law of Moses. Several studies have explicated a coronation and Israelite covenant renewal festival underlying this Mosiah 1-6. The exact nature of pre-exilic festivals in Israel is not totally clear. Critical scholars have identified six elements of covenant renewal rites, which Stephen Ricks has demonstrated in King Benjamin's speech, such as 1. A preamble identifying the author of the covenant. 2. A historical, historical prologue enumerating the mighty deeds of Yahweh on behalf of his people. Three, stipulations of obligations of the covenant. Four, a record of the covenant itself and provisions for its preservation and periodic reading among the people. Five, a list of witnesses. And six, curses and blessings for breach for obedience. And also says, further, the, con the continuity of festival rites from pre-exilic to post-exilic times can provide some idea of the covenant renewal festival and its relation to the right of consecrating the new king. So yes, there are some similarities comparing King Benjamin's speech to a 19th century Protestant Methodist sermon, uh, but there's also, we can see these ancient parallels and antiquity to both a coronation ceremony and ancient covenant renewal, uh, pointing to it having some ancient antiquity as well. Uh, so I think we need to be more careful saying that King Benjamin's speech is just Joe Smith taking from the sermon of Bishop McKendry. You could argue uh, it's based on just 19th century sermons, but then there are these six elements which point to a covenant renewal right 
uh, which scholars have identified in the text. So this is going to come from chapter four of uh, Grant Palmer's book, Insider's View of Mormon Origins. I've just taken a lot of pictures to see of me having to type up, but the, this is comparing now more of the conversion experiences of people uh, in the Book of Mormon to conversion experiences of particularly Methodists uh, in 19th century frontier America. So let's uh, read here. So the Methodist way continues to be seen in Zara Hamlet narrative, whose I-4, 1-3 precisely observes the form popularized by the Methodists. Brentley Metcalf has observed, while it may be true that elements of religious conversions in Joe Smith's environment derive from biblical predecessors, the congregation's response to Benjamin's homily follows an identical non-biblical form of spiritual regeneration developed in Antipolum. So I think he's arguing that you could argue that some of these religious conversions are similar to characters in the Bible, but they're going to point to things which seem similar to the conversion experiences happening uh, in Methodist sermons and revivals. So the Book of Mormon talks about a revival gathering, the Zara Hemlins gathering at the temple to hear the words of King Benjamin, a guilt-ridden falling exercise, petition for spiritual emancipation, absolution, and emotional ecstasy when they are forgiven. Uh, so this is an experience of uh, a woman called Lucy Stoddard. Uh, and in 1825, an itinerant Methodist preacher named George Lean, whom Joseph Smith mentioned in his autobiographical history, penned a vivid account uh, commensurate with Mosiah 4, 1 to 3. I think commensurate just means it's similar. Uh, Lean wrote that young Lucy Stoddard of Palmyra was converted at a Methodist prayer meeting. The great deep of her heart was broken up. She saw clearly that she was a child of wrath and in danger of hell. For this view of her sad condition, she fell prostrate at the feet of her offended sovereign and in the bitterest anguish cried for mercy. In this situation, however, she was not suffered long to continue before she obtained a most satisfactory evidence of her acceptance with God through the merits of Jesus Christ. Her soul was unspeakably happy, and with great emphasis she exhorted others to come and share with her inestimable blessing. So yeah, she's having this experience uh, that she's you know convicted of her sins. She feels that she is a, a child of wrath in danger of hell. Uh, she falls to the ground uh, that she's uh, been offending God um, and she cries out for mercy. And then uh, she wants evidence that she's been forgiven through the grace of Jesus Christ, through his merits. And then she experiences in her soul this happiness, uh, this forgiveness experience, which, uh, you know, Latter-day Saints, we would believe that um, that we can be forgiven as we cry out to God. There's similar experiences in the Book of Mormon. I think we would also believe that any people who turn to God or Christ can have uh, this sort of experience. But uh, the point that Palmer makes in his books is that her experience is very similar to King Benjamin's people. And we're going to look at other conversion experiences and that they're similar to Methodist conversion experiences. And was Joe Smith just borrowing or taking from these Methodist conversion experiences in his environment and then putting it into his Book of Mormon narrative and claiming that these ancient people were having similar uh, spiritual conversion experiences to uh, Methodists. Uh, Lorenzo Doe, one evening a prayer meeting was appointed. Many present felt the power of God. Saints were happy and sinners were weeping on every side. They since have told me that I fell down several times. My distress was so great that I scarcely knew what position I was in. When I got home, I then lay down to rest. I was awake in endless misery. I strove to plead with God for mercy to break these chains. I saw the mediator step in, as it were, between the Father's justice and my soul, and these words were supplied to my mind with great power. Son, thy sins which are many are forgiven thee, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. The burden of sin and guilt and the fear of hell vanished, I now found Jesus and his religion. My soul was so filled. Eliezer Sherman says, after attending a religious meeting, I trembled in his presence. All my sins were then in order before me. I returned again to my sister's house with a wounded heart and cried out, O oh, be merciful to me, a sinner, and may I have repentance unto life, and find the pardon of my sins. I heard, as it were, a soft and pleasant voice saying to me, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, and then was presented to my mortal view the dear Saviour from his birth to his death. I then viewed him on the mercy seat, found peace and the glory of God in all my life, my love extended in the whole world, and I felt to tell them what an inestimable blessing 
religion was. So these are two accounts of people going to uh, a religious meeting uh, that they, uh, you know, maybe physically either fell down or trembled uh, and they cried out for mercy to God that they would be forgiven through Jesus Christ and then had a forgiveness experience and feeling happiness, uh, joy in their soul, which is similar to the experience of King Benjamin's people in Mosiah 4. And Enos has a similar experience of praying for forgiveness. And we'll look at those accounts, Alma the Younger. Uh, so this is Alma the Younger. He says, an angel speak unto us, as it were, the voice of thunder, saying, repent or be destroyed. He fell to the earth and it was for the space of three days. I could not open my mouth. I was racked with eternal torment. For my soul was hard up to the greatest degree and racked with all my sins. I was tormented with the pains of hell. I cry within my heart, O Jesus, thou son of God, have mercy on me, who am in the gall of bitterness, and am encircled about by the everlasting chains of death. When I arose, I could remember my pains no more. Yeah, I was hired up by the memory of my sins no more. And oh, what joy and what marvellous light I did behold. Yea, my soul was filled with joy as exceeding as was my pain. Yea, he thought I saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. Uh, Zizram in the Book of Mormon, uh, after he had heard Alma and Amulek preach, uh, Zizram was the lawyer who was trying to catch them out. Zizram began to tremble. So I think it was similar to uh, Eliezer Sherman began to tremble. His soul began to be hard up under a consciousness of his own guilt. Yea, he began to be encircled about by the pains of hell hell so that's a similar uh, phrasing that was used by one of the methodist conversion experiences pains of hell and he lay sick at sit on with a burning fever which was caused by the great tribulations of his mind on account of his wickedness and as many other sins did hour up his mind until it became exceedingly sore having no deliverance therefore he began to be scorched with a burning heat confessing belief in the power of christ and sought redemption Alma cried unto the Lord, saying, O Lord our God, have mercy on this man. When Alma had said these words, Zizram leapt upon his feet, and Alma baptized Zizram unto the Lord, and he began from that time forth to preach unto the people. Uh, so Alma the Younger and Zizram both had uh, an experience with Alma the Younger. The angel came as with a voice of thunder, uh, and he was uh, sort of, he fell to the earth, and he was sort of struck dumb for the space of three days, and he racked with eternal torment cried out to Jesus, had a forgiveness experience that the pains of his sins were taken away and he was filled with joy and marvelous light. Uh, and then he went on to become a uh, prophet and preacher, uh, Zizram as well. Um, you know, he began to, to tremble. Uh, he was encircled by, by the pains of hell. He was sick, had a fever. Uh, he, he remembered sort of his wickedness and his sins. Uh, and then when, he, when Alma cried out unto the Lord to have mercy on this man, he had some uh, forgiveness experience because Caesar sought for forgiveness. And you can compare these the conversion experiences of uh, some of those Methodists and say, is, is this just the same experience? Uh, is this just Joseph Smith taking those uh, Methodist experiences that he may be witnessing at revivals and attributing it to these ancient characters if he is the author? Or is it possible that these people... Uh, the ancient Nephites were just having similar conversion religious experiences turning to Christ. Um, and it's a similar process of being forgiven. Uh, Lumoni Lumoni's court. So the king believed all of Ammon's words. He fell unto the earth as if he were dead. Soon the queen and court had fallen all to the earth. So this is sort of a, a falling experience, a physical sign of uh, being like sort of convicted of your sins and feeling pain. The Monite began to cry unto the Lord, saying, O Lord, have mercy according to thy abundant mercy upon me and my people. Two days later, the queen arose and stood upon her feet and cried with a loud voice, saying, O blessed Jesus, who has saved me from an awful hell. O blessed God, have mercy on this people. She clasped her hands, being filled with joy, speaking many words which were not understood. When the king arose, he said, Blessed be the name of God. I have seen my Redeemer, and he shall redeem all mankind who will believe on his name. Now, when he had said these words, his heart was swollen with joy. The entire court declared that their hearts had been changed, that they had no more desired to do evil, that they had seen angels and had conversed with them, and thus they had told them things of God, of his righteousness. And Lamoni's father says, 
uh, in nearly the identical words. So very similar experience to Ammon and Lamoni. That this is Aaron and Lamoni's father. And when my father asks Aaron, what shall I do that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast, that I may not be cast off at the last day? And now when the king had said these, he was struck as if he were dead. So prior to this, the king did bow down before the Lord upon his knees and cried mildly, saying, God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me? And I will give away all my sins. And the king stood forth, forgiven of his sins, to minister unto them, inasmuch that his whole household were converted unto the Lord. Uh, so Lamoni and Lamoni's father both had uh, a similar conversion experience, crying unto the Lord, struck as if they were dead, um, almost in a comatose state, it, it would seem. Uh, and then they had some conversion experience uh, as they uh, were converted to Christ. And, you know, the language is such as like, oh, blessed is Jesus who saved me from an awful hell. That does sound to me like a very 19th century uh, Methodist phrase uh, and, and you could say uh, that this is just Joseph Smith as the translator translating it into his vocabulary 19th century Protestant Christianity and they may still be having uh, similar religious spiritual experiences to what was happening at these revivals uh, at Methodist camp meetings. Uh, so uh, let's look at some specific similar conversion experiences. So I'm going to compare Darius Williams and Alma the Younger. At a camp meeting under George Lean's direction, so this is Darius Williams, Marmaduke Pierce preached a short but mighty sermon and closed with a perfect storm. He addressed the wicked with tremendous power. The whole congregation shook like the forest in the mighty wind. Darius Williams fell helplessly in a prayer meeting and lay for two hours in his father's arms. Many cried aloud for mercy. Williams declared that he had found peace. He afterwards became a Methodist preacher. And Alvin the Younger, uh, we know that there was a voice of thunder which shook the earth, and they knew that there was nothing save the power of God that could shake the earth and cause it to tremble as though it was part asunder. Uh, Alma overcame, fell to the earth. He was carried helpless, and he lay before his father for two days. He cried out unto the Lord for mercy, and he found peace to his soul and began from that time forward to teach the people. So yeah, you can see some similarities there. They both uh, sort of fell to the earth they were both convicted of their, their sins uh darius laid in his father's arms for two hours uh, uh, he laid before his father actually it was two days he laid before his father they both cried out for mercy they were both forgiven uh williams went on to become a methodist preacher and alma went on as well to uh teach the people uh so you could say that there's uh some similarities is this joseph drawing upon this experience is this just common Methodist conversion experiences, and that was his inspiration uh, for these conversion experiences to Christ in the Book of Mormon, or are these just similar spiritual experiences, conversion experience, religious experiences uh, that people, ancient people are having converting to Christ, and this is just Joseph Smith's translation of an ancient text. Uh, so you could say that there's uh, some similarities. Is this Joseph drawing upon this experience is this just common Methodist conversion experiences, and that was his inspiration uh, for these conversion experiences to Christ in the Book of Mormon, or are these just similar spiritual experiences, conversion experience, religious experiences uh, that people, ancient people, are having converting to Christ? And this is just Joseph Smith's translation of an ancient text, and you can pick which you find uh, the more likely of those two. Uh, Abel Thornton, the preaching sunk deep into my heart. I wanted religion. Thus the cry of my soul, I continued to cry to the Lord. I heard a still small voice, as it were whispering in my ear, saying, thy sins are forgiven. Enos, the word sunk deep into my heart. My soul hungered. I cried unto him all day long. Did I cry unto him? There came a voice unto me saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven. So you can see some similarities between these conversion experiences, uh, similar sort of stages, motifs, you know, being convicted of their sins often from preaching, wanting to turn to God, wanting to be forgiven, crying out for mercy and having a forgiveness experience. So it's a similar process and even some similar sort of phrasing, uh, hearing a still small voice, uh, knowing that their sins were forgiven. So these people would have also talked about their religious experiences uh, in 19th century Methodist Christianity in the King James Bible English as well. Uh, let's just talk about a few more. So Alfred Bennett, this is some 
phrasing, and there are some ellipses here, but some of the phrasing they would have used to describe their conversion experiences, being awakened, pains of hell, wicked heart, oh blessed Jesus, overwhelmed with joy, unspeakably happy, Savior's image to be pressed on your heart, slumbering consciences, eternal welfare of others, awful terrors, clouds of darkness around your soul, filled with his love, racked with pain. Uh, Eliezer Sherman, who we read earlier, awful pains of death, forever miserable temptations of this vain world. O oh God, have mercy on my soul. What shall I do to be saved? Tremble in his presence, a wounded heart, crying for mercy, trembling steps, a thick cloud in such darkness unto tears, exquisite happiness. Abel Thornton, life is a state of probation. That's a scripture that we see in the Book of Mormon, endless woe, sunk deep in my heart. That's uh, the phrasing of Enos. Hardness of heart, cried to the Lord for mercy, a great change in your heart, his Jesus' arm extended to all, that's a phrase I see in the Book of Mormon, trembling voice, sing a new song, even praises to God. Um, I know that Alma says, I think it's in chapter five, that if you've been able to sing the song of redeeming love, can you say so now? Uh, Children of wrath by nature, George Whitefield, nothing but fire and brimstone, tormented in this flame, awake, arise from their sleep. Jesus stands ready with open arms to receive you. What shall I do to be saved? You rebels, hangs in your death. And this is some phrasing, some similar phraseology in Abinadi speech, and then also from Alma and Amulek. So Abinadi uh, says phrases such as the bands of death, tremble before God, rebelled against God, carnal, sensual, devilish, carnal nature, enemy to God, endless damnation, arms of mercy were extended towards them, tremble, uh, and this comes from Amulek and Alma, began to tremble, hard hearts, chains of hell, awful state, flame ascendeth up forever, life of probationary state, encircled about by the pains of hell, cry unto him for mercy, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God, become his devil's subjects, methought I saw God sitting upon his throne, exceeding joy, singing and praising their God. And I can definitely see uh, the similar phraseology, one one sort of apologetic reconciliation is that Joseph Smith as sort of a co-participant in the translation, this still could be uh, a record of ancient people who are having these conversion experiences being converted to Christ and he is having to clothe it, the translation in his vocabulary, similar to why we see the King James Bible is why we're seeing these similar phrases to Methodist Christianity uh, and preaching, sermons, conversion experiences, because that's Joseph Smith's environment and that's the words he would use, obviously to a critic. Uh, you have viewed as he is just taking uh, and using the vocabulary, uh, seeing the experiences, the conversion experiences of people in his day, and he is just attributing that uh, to these characters in the Book of Mormon. And this is showing that it is a 19th century Methodist uh, Christianity text with uh, Methodist conversion experiences and theology and we'll talk a little bit more about the theology in the next episode uh, so book of mormon sermons interwoven among the modified biblical passages in the book of mormon uh, there are similar examples of literally hundreds of popular phrases from the 19th century so alma 5 uh, says awaken them out of a deep sleep mists of darkness encircled about by the bands of death and the chains of hell a mighty change in your hearts to sing the song of redeeming love, prepared to die, the arms of mercy are extended towards them, a child of the devil, wages of him, setting your hearts upon the vain things of the world. And what I would do as well is I would pause the screen and read through these as well, and you compare uh, how similar you see these phrases as being. Uh, Jacob as well, um, he uh, uses exactly the same emotional descriptive catchwords as evangelical preachers of Joseph Smith's era to produce the same guilt-ridden, trembling, shedding of tears and fainting. Like other Book of Mormon preachers, Jacob spoke in plainness. Uh, so he uses some of these modified King James phrases and evangelical expressions. Wicked hearts, wounded soul, the welfare of your souls, pierced with deep wounds. Feast upon his love, awake from the slumber of death. Pains of hell, his arms of mercy is extended towards you. Awful guilt, endless torment. And in Enos's prayer, you know, he wrestled in prayer, Joy of the saints, sunk deep into my heart. Welfare of my brethren, crying to God, soul did rest, evil nature. So Graham Palmer is saying that these are similar evangelical phrases that would have been used by either preachers or people 
uh, as they are sharing or recording their conversion experiences that we're seeing this in the Book of Mormon. Uh, so let's see what Fair has to say about Protestant sermons or phraseology. I didn't find too many apologetics responding to this specific issue of the similarities in the sermons and conversion experiences as talked about in Grant Palmer's book uh, to the conversion born again experiences in the Book of Mormon. So if you, if you know of any other apologetic or scholarly articles or uh, answers, you know, cite them. This is what I found in Fair. They say it is unsurprising that the Book of Mormon contains themes and phrases used in frontier preaching since frontier preaching was based upon the Bible, which contains the gospel of Jesus Christ. So why would the Book of Mormon not contain many equivalent phrases? This is simply another attempt to figure out how Joseph Smith produced the Book of Mormon without attributing it to a supernatural method. One of the author's example is shown below. So do you exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality? And this corruption raised in incorruption to stand before God to be judged according to the deeds. And then this is very similar to 1 Corinthians 15, 53. Uh, and are we supposed to believe this is fair based upon the author's assertion that Joseph Smith went through the Bible and extracted short phrases in order to modify them and then incorporate them into the Book of Mormon? Well, I think uh, the critic's perspective would be that Joseph Smith uh, must have known the Bible extremely well uh, been very fluent in the Bible, and if he was going to these Protestant sermons, hearing the uh, preaching of different preachers, and all these New Testament phrases and evangelical phrases, like you know, like pains of a damned soul and uh, his arms of mercy being extended forth, like he would have been hearing all those things, absorbing them, and then that's what would have came out uh, in his dictation. And this shows that it is a 19th century text. I think the apologetic would be that, yes, these are 19th century sounding phrases, uh, King James Bible passages and similar phrases in the Book of Mormon. But that could have been Joseph Smith as being a co-participant as the translator, translating similar writings or conversion experiences in the Book of Mormon and then having to translate it into his vocabulary and vernacular, which would have been King James Bible English and some of these evangelical phrases that he would have been uh, hearing and witnessing. Carol Given notes, although the content of the Alma conversion story suggests to some the influence of contemporary conditions, the account as narrated in the Book of Mormon exhibits a complex structure of inverted parallelism or chiasmus that has been persuasively connected to ancient old world forms. The same story, in other words, is invoked as telling evidence of both 19th century composition and authentic ancient origins. Blake Osler sees an example of such divergent readings in King Benjamin's Great Temple speech that incorporates elements common to Methodist camp meeting, but at least is convincing are more than a dozen formal elements of Israelite covenant renewal festivals contained in the speech. Uh, so, you know, Alma 36 is pointed to as this is where Alma is telling him, his son about his uh, conversion experience uh, about him turning to Christ, you know, being racked with the pains of a damned soul, and then turning to Christ, having his experience of being forgiven, experiencing uh, his pains no more, and the light uh, and joy of forgiveness. And that chapter is one really long chiasmus. Now, some apologists point to chiasmus being sort of an ancient uh, Hebrew writing technique, very poetic. Uh, now, there is chiasmus in the Bible. So, a lot of critics or unbelievers don't think chiasmus is a very uh, convincing evidence for uh, ancient origin. But this is a very this is a very long one, and also that Joe Smith was able to orally dictate that you know a, a chapter long chiasmus that's pretty remarkable. He'd have to be some religious genius or order to to pull that off. But I guess it's possible. Uh, but the, the argument uh, that apologists would make is, yes, there are some 19th century elements, the, the phraseology, uh, some of the experiences, you can make the connections between King Benjamin's speech and a revivalist preacher or Alma the Younger or Enos or Zizram, Moni or Lamoni's father having a born again conversion experience to Christ being forgiven of their sins. You could point to, okay, that having some similarities to the conversion experiences of people in the 19th century. But then what about the ancient elements? What about the 
uh, ancient covenant renewal uh, parallels those elements? What about the complex chiasmus pointing to some ancient antiquity as well as 19th century elements? And if you want to check out Blake Osler's, my interview with him on the expansionist theory and how he accounts for both uh, historical ancient elements, but then also 19th century, uh, that can be a way to, to harmonize some of those things for believers. Now, Joe Smith, he was uh, an exhorter, a Methodist exhorter. And interesting, the, the phrase, I exhort you, appears a lot uh, in the Book of Mormon. And that is a 19th century phrase. Um, so when two Methodists, when they would have traveled together, one would have preached and the other would have exhorted. Um, a sermon drew its points from sort of a Bible text. And then there would have been one speaker who re-emphasized the points of the previous speaker, had made and pled or exhorted the congregants to make to take the message seriously. Um, so Joseph Smith, he was an exhorter. So according to Joseph Towner, he says his gift was more for exhortation than preaching. And often under his powerful appeals, the vast multitude would melt like the wax before fire. As previously indicated, Joseph Smith was an exhorter at evening meetings as acquainted with the role of making specific appeals to the audience to apply the preacher's message. Rune 10 can be considered an example of this. Uh, I'm not going to read the full quote, but you can you can have a look at it. But yes, Joseph Smith was a Methodist exhorter. and uh, Perhaps he would have been witnessing uh, preachers giving their sermons. And I think to a critic or a naturalist, you would say this would have to be where he is getting the inspiration and the education and preparation for the sermons he is going to produce in the Book of Mormon. And then Alm is preaching a sermon. Amulek is exhorting. And you could see this as a 19th century element or just view it as Joseph Smith in his translation, having to use his vocabulary of the day. Uh, now, let's go to the next slide. So Farah has to say about Joseph being an, an, an exhorter, although the Palmyra register does not specify the location of the Methodist camp meeting in 1820, we do have evidence that meetings were indeed occurring on Vienna Road. At some point between 1821 and 1829, Smith served as a very passable exhorter at a Methodist camp meeting away down in the woods on the Vienna Road. It should be noted that Matsko's assertion that this occurred between 1821 and 1829 is not supported by the source since Turner never specifies the time frame during which Joseph Smith acted as an exhorter. Despite the fact that Turner is a hostile source, the full quote does contain some important additional information. He said Joseph had little ambition and some very laudable aspirations, the mother's intellect occasionally shone out in him feebly, especially when he used to, uh, when he used to help us to solve some pretentious questions of moral or political ethics in our juvenile debating club, which we moved down to the old red school house on Derby Street to get rid of the annoyance of critics that used to drop in upon us in the village amid subsequently after catching a spark of Methodism in the camp meeting away down the woods on the Vienna Road he was a very passable exhorter in evening meetings. Statement of him being a passable exhorter, uh, you know, they're saying that this comes from his participation in the juvenile debating club as they were discussing sort of moral and political ethics and wasn't actually a licensed uh, exhorter going with preachers. But he might have had some experience there, um, you know, debating, exhorting, that sort of thing. So this has uh, been maybe a wee bit of a long episode. Uh, but in summary, so critics would claim that the Book of Mormon, the preachers and the conversion experiences sound very similar to Protestant and Methodist sermons and conversion experiences happening in Palmyra and the surrounding area in 19th century America. That there is similar phraseology and phrases in these Methodist conversion experiences to that of many of the characters in the Book of Mormon. Some critics believe King Benjamin's speech is like a revival with Bishop McKendry and Benjamin Paddock. Apologists state that the parallels aren't strong. You know, Joe Smith wasn't there, conflating it being Bishop McKendry with another preacher who gave the sermon about personal salvation. And scholars such as Blake Osler point to it having elements uh, being a covenant renewal and a coronation. Uh, critics would point to 19th century sounding Methodist Christianity as evidence that this is a 19th century Protestant book and Joe Smith is borrowing the language and Christianity he was hearing from the revival preachers and the people having conversion forgiveness experiences. 
and that he is also like a sponge. So we take them what he's hearing at revivals, sermons, reading the King James Bible. And that's where the inspiration comes for uh, dictating the Book of Mormon. Uh, apologist believers might acknowledge the similar phrasing that the Book of Mormon has to Methodist Christianity, uh, because Methodist Christianity 1 is similar to the Bible. So it's quoting a lot of uh, King James Bible biblical phrases. And the text of the Book of Mormon is similar to the King James Bible, which was used in the preaching and testimonies of 19th century Methodist ministers and believers. So you could say, okay, the the phrases, the words, the vocabulary of the sermons, uh, Methodist sermons, it's similar to the Book of Mormon because they're both drawing upon the King James Bible. However, I, I did acknowledge some of the uh, similar phrases, uh, you know, the parallels between the conversion experiences, some of the unique uh, 19th century Protestant evangelical phrases. Uh, and I think you could also say that Joseph Smith, under a loose translation, translated the Book of Mormon as the translator into his words and his vocabulary, which would have been in the language of the King James Bible and Methodist Christianity, which he was familiar with as he would have attended often. All translation is a translator having to put or dictate uh, the words into his own words and vocabulary. So you could either interpret it the Protestant sounding Christianity, the sermons, conversion experiences, as the words of Joseph Smith. He is the author, and he is just borrowing and taking the religious language, the sermons, the experiences of people in his day, or that he is clothing the translation, if you want, as a believer, of the Book of Mormon into his language and vocabulary. But these people are having, uh, these are real people in the Book of Mormon having uh, spiritual forgiveness experiences uh, but the 19th century elements or the phraseology still has some ancient antiquity and origin. And you could also say that just ancient people in the Book of Mormon are having similar religious, spiritual experiences being forgiven by Christ, turning to him, repenting. And that's not that much different to what Methodist Christians are doing. They're just expressing similar spiritual or divine experiences so it's not just joe smith necessarily just taking from the conversion experiences of people at revivals in his area and you can decide i, I can totally see the plausibility and the logic from just saying that joseph smith is just taking from these uh methodist sermons and conversion experiences their similar phraseology that's what shows up in the book of mormon i can totally see that's a logical conclusion to draw it was the one that i drew uh whenever i first lost my faith and read grant palmer's book um, i think it's also important to look at the things and we're going to be covering this in our series that uh point to the book of mormon being having 19th century elements but the things which also seem uh ancient or have some ancient antiquity to it as well and perhaps having to shift our view of the translation blake officer's expansionist view of the translation accounting for 19th century elements, Joseph Smith's role as the translator, having to insert and clothe the translation into his language, his vocabulary, uh, expressing uh, idiom phrases, the translation of these uh, people. But you draw your own conclusions. Uh, I don't want to sway you too much. In the next episode, continuing on with this, we're going to be focusing on Protestant theology. In the Book of Mormon is the theology it, as well. Sort of the the doctrines, uh, the things it discusses, infant baptism, baptism by immersion, uh, the the controversies, the Christology, and claims to contain the fullness of the gospel, but why isn't all doctrine in there, such as like the kingdoms of glory, baptism for the dead, eternal sealings. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next video. Uh, but if you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up, uh, like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Uh, so thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you on the next one. Bye. Thanks everyone for watching this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a like, share it with others who might benefit and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. You can also listen to these episodes on podcast form on Anchor or Spotify and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. Check out my website for more content, personal blog, and more. And if you care to donate to support me, you can buy my PayPal or Patreon or through the website. And you can also give donations via YouTube through Super Chats. Thanks for watching Mormonism with the Murph. Take care. Bye-bye.